New York and on the new Hot 97 app. Ebro in the morning. On Hot 97. It's Ebro in the morning. Test. Um, We are here with uh, Justice League NYC. Uh, Carmen, who has uh, been coming on our program now for years, mm -hmm. um, long before it was like, uh, people get mad when I say this, but it is what it is. Long before it was cool to be woke we were having these conversations about um a lot of things going on socially and uh civil rights and um just dealing with how we are legislatively gonna make change that's right right and so when it came to raise the age which um i think we all agree isn't uh where we wanted it to be um, but you know, something did get done, but there's more work to be done with raise the age yes. and closing Rikers and these things, but it takes a long time. And without organizations like justice league NYC and the many other organizations out there who do this on the front lines every single day, uh, making sure not only conversations are happening, but attention is being brought to, uh, the right issues. Um, some of us, including myself would be lost. So Carmen's here. And who do we have? sitting today we have rena and what does rena do <laughs> rena works for forward usa and okay. she works on policy criminal justice reform uh previously worked um at riker she's a lawyer and so she's been doing wonderful work she's been working with us on the bail reform um as well as other organizations so i know rena could introduce herself better <laughs> yeah no i work at forward us i do criminal justice reform policy now um, but I came to this work because I did direct services working, doing criminal defense and civil reentry law for young people that were uh, locked up on Rikers. And who else do we have? We have Jessica Perez. Jessica um, has understood the criminal justice system through her brother, her family, witnessing her mother, and recently um, has been impacted through her son, Pedro Hernandez. But she's a strong advocate. She's the one that involved us in Justice for Pedro. Um, kind of when... Uh, things needed to be elevated. We had a conference call, uh, her, myself, and I think Sean King and maybe Supreme. And then by Monday, that was a Friday, by Monday, we had a coalition of 50 organizations coming to support. But she's been leading the charge along with Luis Hernandez, who is her son and also a Justice League member. But they could also talk a little bit about themselves. Go ahead. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm just a mother. Um, had fought hard for my son and reach out to many people for help and was um, lucky enough to find people like Carmen Perez, Sean King, um, to teach me that staying quiet is not an option, that when we speak up, we, we get changed, we get things done. So I'll pass it on to my son, Luis Hernandez. Um, so um, basically seeing the situation that my brother was in, I didn't want it to basically like repeat history because she went through it with her brother so I wasn't going to allow it to happen with my brother so talk when closer I, to the mic for me too um yeah. when the situation was happening like I knew that I had to be a voice for my brother being that we're close in age he's 18 now I'm 16 we've always been like he's like my right hand man I would say so I knew that he wasn't able to do specific things like he's behind bars and records like he has limited capacity to what he could do so I knew that if I spoke up and if I advocated for him, then things could get done. And where where is that case at right now? The case is dismissed. Yes. The case that he was in Rikers for got dismissed. He still have one currently charged pending. It was a fight between him and another kid. Um, a and how old is he? He's 18 now. 18 now. And this has been going on for two years. Two years. Well, now three. Three, started okay. when he was 15. And this is in the South Bronx, right? Yes. And which is uh, well documented the precinct issues and the police issues going on in the South Bronx, right? What, what's that officer's name? Um, it's, it's different officers, but mainly it was Officer David Terrell. David Terrell, um, right. He didn't sign the paperwork of my son's arrest, but he was always leading the arrest. He was always visiting my building, so... And that was the officer that was trying to date you at a certain point. Was that a true story or is that, I mean, that's what I read, that he tried to holler at you a few times, <laughs> you wasn't having it, and then things started to happen with your son because you wouldn't date this cop. Yeah. Um, you don't like saying it, but you talk yes, closer I, to the mic. I, I, I try to stay away from that conversation. Why? You know, I'm married. And okay. 
my husband would get mad. I never told them that. Do that he was an officer. I didn't want my husband to approach an officer. Right. Of course, especially not in the Bronx. So I left it out many. Now you put me in the spot. <laughs> But, but yes. it was a, that was in the paper. And, and there's so many. I think this happens to some, so many mothers because I think after your case came out, there were other mothers that came forward saying that these officers were trying to have sex with them, right? Yeah, it went, it went from me saying, you know, not the whole truth. I only said part of it. Yeah. That, yes, he was trying to date me. And when I said no, in front of my own mother, he, he, he told me one day, I'm going to break into you. I don't know what he meant with that. But the harassment kept going. I would be parked in front of my building. He would pass in the patrol car, stop, just to try to date me. After I came out and spoke a little about that, different mothers came out that actually he did worse to them. So they got in the patrol car with him at a time. And he's and just for the people watching this, he tried to then, because... I guess the NYPD started to hear these stories and there was a tons of complaints against this particular cop, David Terrell. He then tried to claim that the there was racism oh, against yeah. him, right? Wasn't that a thing? Oh yes, lately he, mm -hmm. he did a, a whole new story saying because he's a black cop, yeah. they turning his the, their back, the police commission is turning the back on him. Now he's trying to play the role of the, the black victim. innocent man. Right. When he put away a lot of black kids by harassment when he violated a lot of black now, women's rights. Now, on the other hand, Mr. Officer David Terrell, if what you're saying is other cops who are white are also doing this and got away with it, and they're only turning their back on you because you're black, I don't necessarily uh, uh, not believe that. But the behavior of police officers using their badge and their power against mothers, single parents... Um, Poor people, like that, this is all a part of the same mm -hmm. problem, That's right. right? Which is abuse of power, right? And 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 really picking on people who don't understand the, uh, I guess, the power that they have as citizens, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about mm -hmm. the same reoccurring issue. Right. Um, so Pedro gets put in Rikers. He's being held with bail, correct? Yes, extremely high bail. How high was his bail? It was 250000 but it had a surety. Talk closer it was two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. But it had a surety. What does that mean? Security that if I were to bail him out with a property, the property had to be worth five hundred thousand. So we put together different properties: my sister's property, my mother's, we cars. When we went to bail him out, it was impossible because the properties only reach the two fifty. That's when we found out we had to come up with five hundred. Mm -hmm. We put in appeals to lower his bail, but the the district attorney was looking the other way just for him to take the five years. They were offering him five years and it's probation. The Bronx DA. Yes, it's the Bronx DA. Who was also, I think, didn't they just get outed for like having something? Somebody was dating the officer David Terrell, right? <laughs> Oh yes, there's so much, <laughs> so much. No, I'm I just mean, trying it's, it's to. Kind of like, I, I, I just I don't. Have, I, I, I just honestly, we're gonna get to cash bail and no, this all no, that. No, no, and because this all leads to it. This all leads to the corruption. This all leads to what happens in poor communities, black and brown communities, every single day. And it's unfortunate that I have to sit here and giggle about it because everybody's in bed with everyone, right? That's the no, way. No, but the literally works. in bed. No, literally, yes. <laughs> no, they had a scandal up in the Bronx, wasn't they having like sex parties at the <laughs> office recently? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and drugs too. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and then one of the deep somebody at the DA was dating the David Terrell dude, and that's a whole story yes, yeah. too. That was the whole situation. Yes. There was a district attorney in the office that was dating David Terrell, and the head DA, like, they knew that we had lawsuits pending towards the officers. And once they seen that the case got dismissed, and like this was a real issue, she let her know like you cannot have any communication with her, and she said, "Well, that's my boyfriend." <laughs> yeah. But wait, he's married. That's yeah. her boyfriend, but he's a married man as well. So I don't, Yo, I don't know how she goes public Yo, the saying Netflix that's joint my on this. Yeah, <laughs> they don't have this on Law and Order. Saying. I don't think yeah. they got this on. They don't want this on Law and Order. This is the truth. <laughs> yeah, the fact that the ADA right was also part of this whole scandal with the police. There's just so much. It 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 is ludicrous. It it makes you think like, okay, so. You think about how crazy things are. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. And we want different results. 
That's why we're all here. We, we're constantly talking about the system is corrupt. It's not set up for black and brown people. Yet we are so disconnected, right, with accountability because what we do is we internalize it. We, we are shamed, right? We don't want to tell the story. Talking about her husband might get upset at the fact that this is coming out. There's just so many layers to this story, and it happens every single day, especially to poor people and black and brown folks. Yeah, the, the, everything that people are talking about, I think, speaks to the fact that the, the power balance in the criminal justice system is so off kilter. Um, and people say, you know, prosecutors have a humongous amount of discretion. They can decide whether to dismiss your case, whether to ask for bail, whether or not to give you a good or bad plea deal, whether or not they just say we're not going to prosecute this issue. And when you actually delve into kind of the corruption and, and some of the ways that they're abusing their power, you need to change laws um, in order to get different outcomes because you can't, con you can't trust the same actors who have um, shown themselves to be predatory to do the right thing. You need to protect the citizens going through the system or else you're going to continue having the same outcomes, which is the people that are given the benefit of the doubt look a certain way and have a certain income, and the people that are constantly trapped in Rikers with criminal records, whether or not they actually committed conduct, look like black and, black and brown folks from a lot of our communities. Well, and so um, a lot of these teenagers are getting in trouble and they're being held in jails like Rikers. And the reason I say it like that is because this is happening all over the country. Yes. Right. It's not this is not just mm -hmm. a New York City thing where you have young people uh, without money or families without money from poor families being held as they're being processed exactly. and waiting for. And we're watching this happen at the border, too. They love this term. We're processing them, right? Mm -hmm. While people are waiting, held, kids are being held in cages, separating from their families, mm -hmm. they're processing. Mm -hmm. And the bureaucracy takes place and the paperwork is moving through and this has got to happen in months mm -hmm. and weeks and years go on. Um, in reforming cash bail and doing all of that, what are we trying to see happen with this? Yeah, I mean, well, we want real reforms that will actually drive down the jail population. So at the very least, that means that you know, in the Constitution, it says you are innocent. We've interpreted it to say you are innocent until proven guilty, not you are innocent until proven guilty if you have enough money to post bail. So we want bail reform such that the vast majority of people going through the system, potentially all, um, are not only being held in jail just because they don't have money. I ideally, it's an end to money bail at all because the research shows that uh, incarcerating people before their trial does not keep anybody safer. It has no impact on public safety. The vast majority of people that await their trials at home do so without impacting public safety. And people get a little bit shook um, because of some of the narratives that we've been told. But the reality is, no matter what I do, if I'm rich, I will await my trial at home. So it's not about oh, we're setting bail on people because what they did is really bad. It's we're setting bail on people and no matter what no matter what you do, if you're rich, you can afford to be out. And if you're poor, you can be in. There's people in upstate New York that are being held in jail on $500 bail. So ideally, it's an end to money bail so that we think of other ways to, to keep communities safe and help people um, return to court and have success in their trials without basically just saying you're in you're in jail because you're poor. So, so we, well, quickly on the bail part, yes. right, before we get to the law part and, and changing law and how yeah. that process. Bail... The, the origins of bail, mm -hmm. right? The origins of you did something wrong, we're putting you in jail unless you can mm -hmm. give us something of value to say that you're not gonna go anywhere it's, and you're gonna come back flight. to, is that right. what it is? It's, it's supposed to be it's, collateral, yeah. right? It's supposed to like, in, in its origin, it's just supposed to ensure your return to court. It's not mm -hmm. supposed to keep you locked up because you can't afford anything. But even that doesn't, um, it doesn't translate because, have you heard of like the charitable bail funds? N no. There's charitable bail funds in New York, Bronx Freedom Fund, Brooklyn Community Bail Fund, and they bail people out that can't afford it um, as like their charitable work. Their, their, the rates of their clients who return to court are higher than the normal rates. It's over 95% of the people they post bail for return to court. So this idea of like putting money down to have skin in the game isn't actually what correlates with you coming to court, which is the only, pro the only purpose of bail. What correlates better with returning to court is if you support people in returning to court. So if you give them text and phone call reminders of their court date, if you ask them if they need transportation assistance to get to court, if you email them to let them know when their next court date is, that, um, that results in higher rates of return to court than setting bail. 
Um, but yeah, originally it was just supposed to be like kind of collateral. You get a little bit of skin in the game, so we know that you're gonna not bounce. You'll you'll come back to court. And and so you have Harvey Weinstein, right? Who posted this bail of how much? A million dollars. A million dollars. Right? Only a million. Um, only a million. <laughs> but he is charged. Wait, and your son had how much? Two fifty. Talking to the mic. Two fifty over five. So a kid from the South Bronx had twenty five percent of the bail mm-hmm. of. One of the richest movie makers we've seen in the last 20 years. Yeah, and, and so. That's crazy. What Rena when you is really saying, think about that. right? So, this bail reform is for the rich, right? Those that could afford it. You have people who are working every single day that if you have them waiting, right, on allegations because they've not been prosecuted, waiting in jail, in prison, like a Rikers. Most likely what's going to happen is they're not going to be able to keep their job. They're not going to be able to provide for their family. They're not going to be able to continue school. Pedro got a full ride scholarship to college. There's all these barriers to success, which we call collateral consequences after you have a felony conviction, right? This is happening before these folks are being prosecuted. We all know the story of Khalif Browder. Khalif Browder, you know, allegedly stole a backpack, was in Rikers for three years. Two of those three years were in solitary confinement, and then all charges were dropped. Right? Again, we are prosecuting poor people, essentially black, brown, and poor people, for not being able to have the financial means to put anything down in order for them to fight their case outside while they're home working contributing to society. So there is this false dichotomy. There's this false narrative out there that we tell our people, well, they committed a crime because we just did a show with Mark Thompson. And there were people who were calling these folks criminals. No, Khalif Browder allegedly stole a backpack, right? The person who was the eyewitness ultimately ended up leaving. There was no eyewitness after uh, some time. He was uh, pointed out after two weeks. There's so many loopholes within the system that punish our children and so there's essentially this war on our children at this moment and a war on our our fathers our our, so, our, our families on our families and, and beyond that um you but know this, uh, and not to cut your thought no, go but, ahead. and carmen you know i say this a lot right <laughs> you know um this is a part of america though mm-hmm. right figuring out ways to capitalize yes on poor people who can't defend themselves so that they can figure out a way to create some revenue right Mm -hmm. and so ultimately just like what we saw with raise the age Mm -hmm. right um when it comes when you challenge people or you challenge these institutions where there's a small town where everybody works at the prison that's their income for that small town Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. if you challenge these this bail system right i'm sure Look, I've been to some towns in America. You go downtown, it's like bail bond after mm-hmm. bail bond after bail bond. These mm-hmm. guys running these offices who I'm sure are contributing heavily to mm-hmm. the this benevolence yep. organization, mm-hmm. union, yada, yada, I mean, having seen dinners. I right now with the, the services that are being provided to the kids that are being separated, right? These individuals are making... Millions. So much, yes. Sixty percent of the companies running the facilities that are housing these kids that are being separated from their families are private companies. Mm-hmm. So big money is made on people who can't protect themselves. That, that's America. why people need to get engaged because you need to go talk to your lawmakers about why you want these reforms because guess what? The bail bondsmen are in those offices every single day yeah. lobbying for harsher laws, higher bails. And so if we... We can't effectively fight back unless we are telling our lawmakers that they're accountable to us, too. I want to ask something before we leave the topic. You said kids get in trouble. 80% of those kids didn't commit the crime. 80% of those kids... Well, I think in general, when I say kids get in trouble, is teenagers in inner city, suburban, kids are kids, right? They fight. They do some graffiti. They hop a turnstile. But when you live in the city... Your punishment is your jail. Childish behavior. Yeah. Your childish so, behavior. Ch- your mm-hmm. teenage mischief is like, could result in you being in jail for two years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem is, we have a lot of kids that are sitting in Rikers because they too scared to say who did the crime because if they say who did the crime, they, they end up dead. Mm-hmm. So, we got to keep in, 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 in consideration 
that most of these kids waiting trial, they being punished for something they didn't do. Yeah, mm-hmm. fact. And, and not only that, they being mentally abused, mm-hmm. physically abused, mm-hmm. not only by taking their freedom away, they they, they getting hurt in mm-hmm. Rikers Island. Mm-hmm. You understand? Not only my son, I see many kids getting hurt, mm-hmm. come out to the streets, they get put in medications in Rikers Island, mm-hmm. come out to the streets without no medication. Now they go into a psychotic breakdown, they commit a crime, now they become a criminal. Yeah. Because they, they would put a medication to relax, now they send to the streets like animals, Without no health, no medical um, um, warnings, and now, now, now we got a criminal. So and if this kid was a good kid, now he turned into a criminal. So they damaging the communities mm-hmm. the, by by a lot by, of by having these high bills. So everything falls into the same place. Yeah, and a lot of these know. young people who are in there are getting offenses while they're locked up for just protecting themselves. Mm -hmm. And we see that all the time. There's something else, you know, we talk about closing down Rikers and and I think we said it last time is that you can't close down Rikers without bail reform. And we also need a multi-pronged strategy. It's not just bail reform. Say that again, you can't close down Rikers without bail reform because... Because a lot of those young people... 75% of the people being held on Rikers are there on bail. Mm -hmm. And... We need a multi-pronged approach, right? A lot of these individuals don't have the ability to to have a transparent process called discovery, right? So there's also discovery reform that needs to happen. What's that mean? Discovery is the opportunity to have information regarding your case so that you could then fight it. Unfortunately, right now, many people don't understand what these allegations against them are. Don't understand until they go to court. And there's also... Yeah, New York has one of the four worst discovery laws in the country, which means that prosecutors that are building these cases against you, you are not entitled to even see very basic evidence like the police report until the day of trial. Mm -hmm. So people are taking plea deals um, because they don't know how strong or weak the cases are against them. Their lawyers can't really prepare to take them to trial. I mean, not everybody uh, has the kind of moral fortitude of a, a Pedro or a Caliph and says, I know I'm innocent. I'm going to sit in Rikers Island until you can prove me guilty. So many people on Rikers Island take deals to things that they didn't do, whether or not they're completely innocent or they know that prosecutors upcharge, which they do all the time. They charge you higher than what they actually think you did so that when you take a plea deal, you end closer to what you actually did. So then we're just... We're just ending up with so that the people in Rikers Island who are black, brown, and poor people are the people with criminal records. And then we say that proves our theory that poor people and brown people are criminals. No, poor people and brown people are forced into a coercive experience Mm -hmm. where they're taking plea deals um, and getting criminal records whether or not they did it because they don't want to be tortured every day in a jail. And as someone who was on Rikers Island every day or every week uh, for a year and a half, um, it is it is torture. I asked a 16 year old on Rikers Island who hadn't been talking to anyone for four days what he wants to be when he grew up. He was very quiet for 30 seconds and then he just looked at me in my eye and was like free. So to hear that from a child, um, it, it's not, it's a punishment, it's torture, it breaks families, it breaks people. Um, and the only reason why we allow people to do this is because people with means and, and people who have more typical power in society are never going to be subject to that. They will never be in jail pre-trial because they will always have the resources to post their bail. And so what are the next steps? Well, we have how many days left? Three more days Three in the legislative days. session. Yeah. June 20th is, is this when it's getting ends. momentum? Yes, yeah. So there's a bail reform bill that passed the New York Assembly. Um, Latrice Walker's bill, it's a it's a good bill, it's good policy. It eliminates money bail for all misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies and then really narrows the amount of people who can be prevented Tentatively detained, which means like being held without the possibility of bail, that passed the assembly. Um, it has to get through the Senate, but as all things with politics, like what needs to happen is real reform needs to pass. So people need to be um, getting in touch with their elected officials, or you can go to um, KhalifBrowderFoundation.com and sign Akeem Browder's pledge to end uh, pretrial detention. You can go to our website, which is MoveJusticeFWD.us, and there, if you put in your information, we'll uh, help you send an email to all your elected officials. But so let me ask you, who's against this? This is what I always liked, you know me. 
<laughs> you know, I, I yeah, what was I like, the man's name who called us from Appalachia mm, the other day, Charlie or something. Charlie, there's a man who Jason. called. He's like, they're all criminals, and I was like, wait a second, so these are allegations. Name? This is a, a an affair. This no. is somebody. Oh, this is a man who um who actually called into the station. But who's against this? The DAs are against this. Right. The prosecutors are okay. against this. The district attorneys are against this because this um, cuts into their money. No, they'll still no. make the same amount of money. You know. I think district attorneys are against this because they like having all the discretion in the world. I think if you are so it motivated, some of their power. yeah, and if you are motivated to have a high conviction rate, it's easier to get a conviction. And what when does someone a high conviction on. rate do for a district attorney? It's success. Re-election. Re-election. Yeah, Re-election. I'm good at what I do. I lock up the bad guys. Right. Um, it's much harder. But to- couldn't you still have a high conviction rate? For people who actually. For people who actually. Not did if something you're wrong. arresting large swaths of people based on what they look like and who they are and not because you have strong evidence that they did something wrong. So the, the way the conviction rate is tallied is based on how many people come in. Yeah. So if I have, how, are, however many cases I have on my desk, however many of those end in a conviction is like my conviction rate. Got it. So maybe that needs to be adjusted too, because some of these people aren't being, yes, we, there's no crime. So how are they factored into your conviction rate we exactly we should not be wanting prosecutors to win we should be wanting prosecutors that find out what really happens and decline to prosecute when they don't have enough evidence to prosecute but they're not we're ro- rewarded that way that is not in the role that they are currently playing in the society largely because there's not a lot of accountability for prosecutors they have a, a lot of discretion so that's an area where we need to do some work yes right? Oh, I'll give you this. There's a lot of prosecutorial. And I know work. there's a lot of prosec- <laughs> prosecutorial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's where. Is that a word? I know that's happening on a nationwide <laughs> level where people are yeah. trying to get, like, what's happening in Philly races are going to be really important. And, like, important. the Players NDA. Coalition, those the NFL play, yes, players, they, yeah. they're doing a great work about prosecutor accountability all over um, the country. But, yeah, prosecutors are against it. Bail bondsmen but clearly, um, are, but against, are against it. Y'all are scumbags it. anyway. Let's keep um, it a thousand. And, you know, the same people who think that our system is fair. The people that are privileged in enough denial. to think they our system is fair. They the think, people who are like, yo, we're putting kids in exactly. these tent cities and keeping this is terrible. This is not what America is. No, this is what America exactly. is. It's always been this way. Shit is fucked up and we treat poor black and brown people very, very bad since the beginning. But we are trying to make it better and actually live up to the marketing idea and the, all the ideas that we I have. I think it's our here. responsibility to make it better, right? Like, you know, what I think about what's happening right now with the children in the borders of Mexico, it, this happened in the 1930s when we deported one million mm-hmm. people who were citizens of the U.S. back to Mexico. This happened under Operation Wetback. This is constantly repeating itself because what we have is we have amnesia of what happened and what we've done in this in country slavery. to other this people. Mm-hmm. Exactly. This has arrived. happened to Chinese people, Japanese people, African Amer- or, or Africans that were brought to America. This has happened because people have allowed it. What our generation is saying is we're not going to allow it. There's, you, We have a 16-year-old sitting here talking about bail reform, talking about it was his responsibility to ensure that he didn't and his brother didn't go through what their mother went through. We are wanting to stop this now. It's got to be a multi-pronged approach. we got to pass bail reform. we got to pass the discovery Every bill. Reform. we got to also work on speedy trial, right? And not just that, we got to do system accountability, Ebro. We never talk about holding these DAs accountable accountable, these police officers accountable, these uh, probation officers uh, accountable. We need the data. Where are people coming from? Where are the concentrations of people being referred into the system? How do we hold the system accountable? How do we stop putting poor people, black and brown folks into the system across the country. I come from California. There was a hundred percent rate of young people that were black and brown in the system awaiting to be adjudicated, right? When we look at Horizon in the Bronx, it's nothing but black and brown kids that are locked up. Does that mean that white kids don't commit crimes? No, it's the fact that they do commit crimes and they have a different system set up for them. And we're not trying to play those this race card, but at the end of the day, I want people and listeners to understand understand that you don't have to be an expert in this in order to care. Pedro's Hernandez family got involved because they were directly impacted. I've dedicated 23 years to this because my brother was in the system. My sister was killed, buried on my birthday. I learned restorative justice from my father who said, I can't take another mother's child away, but we can do our part. And I know that people are overwhelmed. They don't know how to get involved and there's ways to get involved forward. 
movejusticefwd.us. <laughs> you can email your lawmaker and tell them that this issue is important. I think I think it's like to your point about national versus New York. New York, j there's 16,000 people in jail every single day in New York just awaiting their trial. So that's a ridiculous number. But New York does have a moment to like live up to its progressive reputation. And there are, there are bills in the floor Everybody's ready except for the lawmakers. We talked about the opponents, but 70% of people po polled across the state, rural areas, Republican, Democrats, are in, for in favor of bold bail reform. Reform. So it's really just about making our lawmakers make it happen. They can't continue to drag their heels. They can't continue to say next session because those are 16,000 people in jail that can't afford to wait. And the only way we can generally hold some of these lawmakers accountable is to make sure we help them lose their jobs when they're not accountable, right? Like make sure they don't mm -hmm. get voted back in. We should not be reelecting DAs that are, you know, Stefan Clark, right? What we learned about that DA is that that DA who. Tell was, me where this is from. This is from Sacramento, okay, right? He yes. was just killed in his grandmother's Ste oh, backyard. Stephon, I thought that was a different yeah, attorney. Stephon no, Clark, Stephon Clark, no, the young man, the that young got man that yes. just got killed yes. in Sacramento. That DA, right, that was supposed to prosecute that police officer, they had turned off their camera at or yep. the audio, right? We all saw it. Everybody saw that. What happened is that that same DA took money from yes. the police union, yes. right? Again, there's so much corruption. There's so many layers to this, but I don't want people to feel discouraged. They could do something. At this moment, there's an opportunity to reform the bail system here in New York. People could go to these websites. They could follow at NY Justice League on social media. We tweet things out all the time. If you don't have social media, sign up for our mailing list at mm -hmm. gatheringforjustice.org. Right now, there's a... Um, why wouldn't you have in this day and age Facebook or something? Yeah. Well, because some people just don't got it. You know, I, I got to respect those that just don't have but access. we need you we do, to <laughs> we do this do. so that the, the flow of information is much faster. Yeah. Because okay. things are happening fast. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter, I'm gonna start leveling up on Twitter at Reen Namin uh, at R E E N A H M E A N. Um, and do y'all tweet Facebook? Oh, oh, Louis. Yeah, um, I have Twitter as well. Um, I'm not gonna say the app, it's too long, but as to what Carmen said, I wanted to add in because fueling to the system and with bail reform is the school to prison pipeline, which is often not talked about. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she said everybody could get involved, and I believe that's a true statement because while adults have the ability to vote and make sure policy happens and make sure bail reform goes through, like we don't have that ability because we can't vote, but we do have a voice either way. So like we could still advocate, we could still host town halls. And, and you will be voting. Mm -hmm. yes. Soon come so, midterm elections. Midterm will, elections no, are saying, happening. Don't forget, two years happens fast. Yeah. But also this year, there are so many important races this year. We're trying to get one million people. I'm also part of the Women's March. We're trying to get one one million people to the polls. Power to the polls registered. Also, I want to share with folks that there are 70 million people with felony convictions in this country. There's a campaign going on in California called. Uh, second chances uh, with the California for Safety and Justice to do felony sunsets that would allow people to get their lives back. And so there's so many campaigns, criminal justice campaigns, so many po people working on this issue. We're gonna be going, Justice League is going to California. Um, I leave on Tuesday, but the team is coming. <laughs> Uh, because we're going to be doing a concert there uh, with different people to bring attention to that. And we're also people to sh asking people to show up and register other folks to vote. So there's an opportunity right now. Like, you know, there are people sitting in prison who don't have access to voting. And there's so many of us that are just chilling at home or we're listening to Ebro, you know, popping out, popping <laughs> up. Popping shit. Popping whatever. <laughs> popping bottles. But no, it's I'm important not, I'm that not we a go. bottle popper. <laughs> I just pop shit. That's it. I don't really but pop that It's up. important that I we pop understand. I popped my daughter's birthday balloon the other day. <laughs> no, nah, it wasn't a birthday. It was from a carnival in the neighborhood, not her birthday. Oh, my God. It's somebody else's birthday. <laughs> yeah. So all that to say is that everybody could be involved. I was once feeling hopeless. I was 17 years old. I remember, you know, going down to to you know bury my sister and I didn't know what to do and this has changed my life and I just want to say that so many people um, know somebody or have been impacted by incarceration themselves and we're fighting for you so you know fight with us uh, ladies and gentlemen Justice League NYC I appreciate the work you guys are doing as well thank you very much for being active and let's continue to get the information out there um, I, I do oh oh we have something special for Justice League NYC. Lewis, bring that. Oh. Carmen, stand up. 
Wow. The Hip Hop Has Heart Foundation <laughs> donating $10,000. Turn turn to the camera so they can see it. Carmen, you got to like hold the check like they do on the TV shows. <laughs> um, you know, we are uh, here at Hot 97 been working with Justice League NYC for a long time. And um, we had Summer Jam recently, and we take proceeds from Summer Jam, and we give that to organizations uh, all over the city, and we got $10,000 for you guys. So. We just got to wow. say from Justice League, we appreciate you. We appreciate Nessa, Laura, yeah. you know, all of you. Um, Y'all been holding us down for a long time and have allowed us to share the work that we do when nobody was listening. So we want to thank you on behalf of our family. The big check. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Hey, you guys, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for having us. <laughs>